Today is to be joined by sports performance nutritionist Kate McDade and the owner of NutriCage as well. I suppose a lot of people already know you from your nutrition work Kate but maybe if you could just in introduce yourself to people who maybe uh, don't know you. Yeah well firstly thanks so much for having me on the podcast. I'm delighted to be here Paul so thank you for the invite. Um, I am a health and performance nutritionist. I run my own nutrition consultancy called Nutricate. So we're now a team of five, um, which is very exciting. And I suppose what we would do on a day to day is we work with elite um, athletes. You know, uh, we work with different teams um, around the country from multiple sporting disciplines. Uh, we work with the general population, those looking to improve their health. Um, and, and performance from a day-to-day -day perspective and we work with corporate entities too so delivering seminars workshops and um, so the work we do is is nice and varied I suppose my own background I studied uh, sport and exercise nutrition I did my master's with uh, Loughborough University um, and I have pay, played uh, competitive sport for, for a very long time now, um, basketball being my jam. So I suppose I saw the benefits that were supposed to be gotten with, um, I'm sorry, um, I suppose the benefits, the background noise, the joys of working from home. <laughs> um, I suppose um, I saw the, the benefits that you could get, I suppose, firsthand from, you know, getting and um, marrying you know correct nutrition practices with um your your performance and seeing the the benefits you get from that so um i suppose that's what sparked my interest you know way back when um as well as being fortunate enough to work with a, a nutritionist or shadow a nutritionist when i was only 15 and really that kind of was the turning point for me i knew then and there that this was the the route I wanted to take so fast forward to 2017 and I set up Nutricate after you know working in the industry over in the UK for uh, just under two years um, and yeah thankfully we're still afloat and things are going well <laughs> and like a lot of people always have a dream to stay the business when they're younger but when you actually decide to go for it and um, all the challenges you encounter how did you find that yourself yeah, like I suppose my biggest thing was I, I don't really know what the when the definitive moment was in terms of, you know, when I, you know, decided that I wanted to have my own business. Like I know I was young when I did make that decision and I don't even really think I fully appreciated what it was like, you know, or what shape it would take, what exactly it would look like. Um, but obviously here I am now at Nutricate, um, yeah. and you know it definitely is super challenging like every day like there can be a hundred different emotions like so you can go from feeling like literally on top of the world like you've got all your ducks in a row to feeling like you literally don't know anything <laughs> um you don't know what's going on so it definitely you know there's loads of hurdles but I do I do love it um, and I suppose the biggest thing for me was because I knew I wanted to have my own business um I kind of got to a point where, you know, I was obviously working in a different consultancy. I was working for someone else. And, you know, those kind of maybe little bits of doubt start creeping in. And for me, like regress is just a horrific thing, I feel. So I was like, look, let's give it a go. Yeah, it might go belly up, like, or it might be actually what you want, like, because obviously, you know, reality versus what you think you you may need or want can be very different things. So, you know, I suppose it was important for me to try it, give it a go, and if it all went belly up, like I had my education and you know, good education at that, and um, as well as experience, you know, done at that point. So, worst case scenario, it doesn't work out, and I just find another job like Joe but I didn't want to see myself in like three four ten years time and still 
you know, I hadn't tried my own business. And I also was very worried that those little bits of doubt or that bit of imposter syndrome that was, you know, rearing its head um, would consume me and then I'd never get to do it. So I just felt like, okay, I need to get out of where I am, throw myself into the deep end. And if I sink, I sink, whatever. Obviously, I won't be overly enthused by that. But you know, at least I tried. Um, and if I swim, all the better. But um, but yeah, so that's kind of, it's definitely a challenge, but it's one I, I do enjoy. And as I said, like, you know, there's good days and there's certainly bad days as well. Um, but um, it is it is enjoyable. And I, you know, I do I love what I do. I love the team I have. Um, you know, the my crew are, are brilliant. So yeah, it makes life easier and, and very enjoyable. Um like running a business uh, like you're running it it's very similar to sport as you were saying good days and bad days uh dealing with your positives and your setbacks but for you how do you turn the setbacks nearly into a positive yeah good question like i mean i definitely like i suppose from the the sporting side like one thing that i've noted is you know failure is another kind of learning curve so you know why didn't I succeed and what can I fix to make sure that doesn't happen again or I don't feel as crap as I feel now <laughs> um again so I try to kind of bear that in mind and like it, it is easier said than done sometimes you know like particularly if you invest a lot of time effort if you're really proud of something um, and it doesn't pull off like the same way you know you you work so hard at training and then you you turn up to the all Ireland final, whatever it might be, and you play crap. Like during that kind of way, it's like the worst case scenario. No one wants to be in that position, but it can happen for whatever reason. So, um, or or you don't win the game, or whatever it might be. Um, so, yeah, I just try and you know keep it firmly in my mind that it is another chance to learn to grow. I think reflection is really really important. So that's something that I do as often as I can. I get my team to do um as often as we can. Like even last night, you know, I, I was doing a cook along um and straight away my my colleague was on with me and you know straight away after the session I was like, how do you think that went? Like what can we do better? Do you know, and then we, we hash out um a few thoughts because um I think it's really important to to be honest with yourself and you know if if there either were corners caught or maybe if you didn't approach something in an appropriate manner. Um, it's not to get caught up in the, you know the fact that you kind of fell at that hurdle but it's you know making sure that okay well maybe I needed to to learn this lesson before I could progress or get to where I want to be so I just I always try and keep a positive spin on it like that doesn't mean that I don't mourn the, the loss of the failure for a certain period but it's you know that isn't I'm not going to let it I suppose become me or define me um, and there's so many more kind of cogs uh, to success than than that one um, that one factor. So I think, and I definitely think as as an entrepreneur, like you just have to kind of take um, take the knocks. And it's the same with sports. It's like doing the same thing over and over again and not getting sick of it. And um, and doing the same, uh, you know, from a practice perspective or a consistency perspective in a business uh, term. Um, and then also kind of learning from what is working well and, and trying to push that out there and also taking from what hasn't been going well and and, and being honest enough with yourself to recognise if you were wrong and, and you need to adjust things. Um, so I think between my team at Nutricate, my friends and family, like my networks are very, you know, they've done me a solid on many accounts and they kind of keep me sane. They allow me to bounce ideas off. And again, that's another part of being you know, from basketball, I also play Gaelic football uh, now for, you know, just to, to kind of keep myself ticking over in my in my off season. And again, it's the same thing, like uh, that team dynamic where everyone's kind of helping each other, supporting each other. You know, you can bounce different thoughts off uh, your teammates. And, and that's what I've done, I suppose, both in my personal and my business life, which, you know, I think working together, um, you know, you can be a lot stronger and successful so that's what I've I suppose tried to emanate from uh, in the in the business uh, side of things. Um, you mentioned there you play football but you play for Kimmelho Crokes and your brother plays for Ballyboden. Uh -huh. Does that cause a bit of controversy in the house? 
I'm going to tell another span in the works, Paul, and you're going to think we are some yokes in the MacDade household, but my sister plays for St. John. So there you go. And we all actually do like each other. <laughs> we get on very well. Um, I don't really know how that happened. My parents weren't best pleased when they saw the purple and yellow of the Crokes jersey <laughs> rocking up to the house, um, if I'm being totally honest. But, um, but yeah, we all find ourselves in different clubs. I started football like only two or three seasons ago. So I'm very late to the game. So when I was picking a club, like I knew a few people in Crokes, it made sense for me. Like I wasn't, uh, I went for the easy option, so to speak. Um, but I don't know where where Sophie and, and Robert went wrong, to be totally honest. <laughs> <laughs> and you're an internationalist for the Longford Men Senior team and the Dublin Ladies. Do you notice a big difference between being involved be between a men's and a ladies team? Um, yeah, I get asked this uh, quite a bit. Like, not really in the sense that, um, like both teams like are obviously you know very uh driven as you'd imagine in you know an inter-county setup would be so um and you know everyone wants to do the best that they possibly can um you're going to have different personalities so like uh while you might be working with groups on uh certain fundamental principles or you know objectives uh there's you know individuals individuals which will receive information in different ways and certain delivery will work better for different athletes so that doesn't really change between males and females like um and I suppose the way you deliver your your message uh, you know has to be altered depending on the individual in front of you and um, to make sure the penny is dropping so that's why I think it's really important you know as much as you can because you don't always get the opportunity to get to know your athletes you know, it depends on how closely you get to work with the team and you know how much time you're given with the team uh, but I do think it's it's important to uh, try and get to know the team uh, you know as best you can on an individual basis um, because that's usually when like little conversations is usually when you know those gaps in knowledge appear or you know it's very evident to you that okay this is actually what they need right now and you know it, it literally can be in a few minutes you fix something that if you hadn't have just stopped to ask them about their day you wouldn't maybe have heard because you know some athletes will be very forthcoming will you know give you a buzz drop you a text and others you know not so much so I think it's more uh, getting to know uh, the the team as a group and where they're at and what they need um, and then you know as best you can if you can get to know them on an individual basis and um, you can start to figure out well what does this person need and how best will they receive that information and um, so it's not so much like males and females because there's overlapping characteristics in both I find um you know and obviously with with females you might you have things then like maybe the menstrual cycle which is obviously not going to overlap with the long for men's team of course but uh, so that might be different but um in terms of how you how um you're delivering information or how it's received it just depends on on the individual really and about knowing that what what the, what makes them tick so to speak and when you're making, say, meal plans or doing diets out for the players involved in this, these teams, it must be very challenging because some players are obviously looking to get bigger. Some players might be looking to lose a bit of weight. So it, it must be very challenging for you as well. Um, yeah, it, it can be. Like, I suppose when you're working with teams, um, you know, and, and panels, like there can be a lot of, athletes to cater to so again I suppose it comes back to you know how much time have I got with this team how often do I get to see them and then you just prioritize how best to use uh use your time like what's going to stand by these athletes the most you know most effectively so whether I'm looking to help them lose weight or you know drop body fat or or increase muscle mass maybe it's not um 
maybe I don't have the luxury of talking to everyone on an individual basis as much as I'd like. So perhaps pl- uh, priority players might be highlighted or players who might need a bit more support than others. Or you might be looking to get them maybe into groups uh you know of the same kind of goals um so then you can do group discussions instead of one-to-ones and um, so it just I suppose from my perspective I need to be very clear have it very clear in my head you know what's the time that I have with the this group where are they at and how can I use that effectively for myself so I'm not stressed out of my head and um, you know trying to maybe uh, fulfill Uh, expectations that could never be met Um, and then for the athletes so that they are getting you know the the core um, information that they need and that will help them progress and get over the line so I think um, preparation uh, from my end and having a good sense of you know what is available to me is is really really important and makes life easier for for both the athletes and myself. And would it be something when you're involved in teams or your athletes that they do track their food or how does it work? Uh, yeah, again, it depends. It depends on the athlete. It depends on what their their needs are. I definitely do, you know, work with some athletes um, to, to track and, you know, tracking can be useful from an educational piece. So uh, getting a, an athlete uh, comfortable with maybe they're just, um, tracking their carbohydrate intake so they understand okay geez this is what you know a carb loading day might look like or this is what my training day should look like or whatever it might be um, so tracking can be useful from a, a portion size uh, perspective it can also help with um, an athlete understanding what their energy demands actually look like in terms of food so it can be an educational tool that might come in for a couple of weeks for one person where whereas for another person it might be something that they like to do uh, over a longer period of time or in detail them with you know body composition goals whether that's to lose weight increase muscle mass but on the other side of things like it actually might be the worst thing for another type of athlete who maybe finds that they get a bit too obsessive uh, on that kind of in that kind of realm of tracking is that going to take from their performance is that going to put them under undue stress you know so perhaps guidelines might be a better um a better way to to roll with them and um, you know where you're giving them maybe more tangible advice versus okay log everything in an app and um, so so yeah it, it just depends on the athlete so you know I've got I'm just trying to think of of you know the last few consultations I've had with different athletes from from different teams and yeah there's a, a mixed bag of who's tracking and who's not and again it comes down to who is in front of me and what is really going to help them um because people you know no one size will fit all um and depending on where we're at in the season will change things around too and depending on their kind of uh, background and their knowledge to date will um will kind of influence what what approach you take with them and a lot of people's perceptions say on cheat meals can be that they've had chocolate and they're unhealthy or whatever what's your perception I suppose on cheat meals I hate the idea of cheat meals like again I think this uh, ties in with so much that's wrong with um, how maybe some of us can can uh, view food like um, you know whether you're an athlete or not like I mean health is obviously so important um for us all um and you know health encompasses many different facets so um you know food is there to be enjoyed so even you know foods that mightn't be overly nutritious or you know mightn't lend themselves to providing you with different nutrients that you might need as such it might be helping you in another way in terms of you know allowing you to to socialize to enjoy the nicety of the food um, and and you know in some cases it can be um like part of a you know your pastime or something that you might enjoy with people close to you and it can feed into your health in in other ways so to speak um so 
you know, I think cheat day, cheat days, cheat meals, like they kind of stem from this like all or nothing mentality where it's either like I'm healthy and everything that's not nutritious needs to go. Um, you know, and we'll see how long that lasts. And then, you know, you might find yourself with dying for your cheat day or um, you know, binging maybe perhaps if you if you've gone teetotal on um on not consuming anything that you don't deem to be clean or healthy or you know whatever it might be um you know I think you can be a high performing athlete I think you can be a healthy individual and still enjoy food that's not overly nutritious or maybe what you might include in your cheat meal or whatever it might be but that is that then like if by labeling it like something like this and sorry I'm probably going off on a tangent here uh, you're um you're insinuating that there's something wrong and there's not anything wrong with enjoying your chocolate or whatever it might be for you. The only time it becomes a problem is when it's debilitating or it's getting in the way of something like your recovery or indeed, you know, it's, it's not supporting, um, not supporting your health or whatever it might be. So I think um, moving away from this all or nothing or this idea that, you know, you're, you're cheating yourself um, by by having um by going kind of uh, mental in in one sitting um i don't think that's a, an appropriate way to look at things or you know i don't think it's a um it's actually a very healthy way to look at things um so i definitely would move away from that and that's not something i would look to um encourage and even with with athletes that I'm working with or a general population and um, it's trying to get them comfortable with the idea of okay well what are the the main what is the framework of my diet that I is a non-negotiable so to speak and then you look to add in you know where okay well where do these like less nutritious things fit into and um you know because because again we have to look at sustainability um as well and it's you know not very sustainable to and um, to have kind of black and white thinking with an area that isn't is anything but black and white so um so yeah so I don't know I hope that answers your question and I felt like I was kind of losing myself in the tangent there Paul so no, I mean, I my question um but like before a game say a week before a game or for you what is your role as the nutritionist with a team and on game day as well so it depends on kind of I suppose what how much access I have to the team but if I am working with um a team you know kind of more hands-on say um I suppose the lead up to to a game you're making sure that uh, everyone's comfortable with their strategy you might be sending in uh, reminders ideas and around how they can meet their their um game game preparation um you're making sure that recovery is appropriate after session. So for some teams, you might be able to take that a step further, making sure that catering is is meeting their recovery uh, requirements. Um, and then I suppose game day, you're looking at, you know, have is there anything, again, it'll depend on what the team have available to them. But, you know, if there's um, sometimes in dressing rooms, there might be a, a table to set with, um, with I suppose uh, pre-match um, snacks and um, there might be different supplements so you're making sure everything is like in order on that front you might be creating um, kind of uh, sports drinks for them or electrolyte solutions for them for dur the duration of the game and then you might be looking at either catering or um, making sure that there's some sort of recovery and um, meals or snacks in place post uh, match. But again, it just depends on how ha hands on you are with that team um, and uh, I suppose uh, what they have available to them. Um, you know, so you uh, that will dictate a lot as to what I get to do. But uh, another role, I suppose, on game day would be if there's anyone um, who is worried that, you know, about, oh, God, things weren't, you know, my usual uh, routine. Like you're there to listen and to reassure and to fix anything if it needs to be fixed. And um, so so sometimes you're just there as a, a reassurance. And um, some teams have a pre-match meal together. So you're making sure that's all running smoothly and everything, you know, ran as it should. And 
uh, athletes with dietary requirements were looked after and so on and so forth. So it's it's varied. Um, and as I said, it will depend on your role within the setup that you're in as to how much say or how or even if you're there on game day or not. A question that actually came in a lot from um, followers on the page was about um, pre-match meals. Um, for you, what are the, I suppose, ideal pre-match meals? Yeah, so when it comes to this, um, I suppose before we even get into what you're eating, um, it's looking at your timing. So that can be different for, for athletes too. So anywhere between two to four hours might be where your pre-match meal should fall. So obviously that's quite a... A, a big discrepancy so you might find you know if you're part of a team you don't really have a say as to if it's two hours or four hours that will go on what works best for the team and um, and what's been organized so in that instance like you might have some athletes sitting down to the full meal and you might have another athlete maybe just having half of it half that meal or nibbling at it or whatever it might be or they might have their own snack and um, if if the timeline isn't right for them so I suppose what you're looking to include would be, you know, some protein, a little bit of fat, um, but, per, you know, a, a decent amount of carbohydrate. Um, our aim would be not to have, you know, probably anything that's spicy, creamy, uh, high in fat, high in fiber, um, which can kind of upset um, upset our tummies. Um, so I suppose... Ideal options would be something maybe like a, a lean mince uh, bolognese with a, a baked potato or some pasta. Um, you know, you might be looking at chicken and rice um, or, or something along those lines that are super easy to digest and tasty and, uh, and they're going to make sure your fuel and, and hunger is kept at the, sorry, make sure that your fuel and that hunger is kept at bay um, going in, into that game. So, so yeah, I suppose fizzy drinks are probably something that you want to avoid. They wouldn't be on my, um, my top uh, fluid uh, list to accompany my, my pre-match meal. But um, anything along that line that is, you know, high in easy digesting carbohydrates. So you might be looking at your white pastas, your white rice is there. Um, and, and some protein like lean mince, as I mentioned, or chicken. Um, would be good options on, on that front. Is tracking calories something you focus on with a, a lot of your athletes? Uh, tracking calories with some of them, as I mentioned, it can be a useful kind of educational piece and it can be useful to keep athletes on, you know, on track. Some people love it, some people hate it. So it's just about knowing like what what works for the person in front of you um so so yeah so some of my athletes are on it others aren't and um, it's just i've made those decisions based on what the athlete has maybe even told me that they they need or want or what i feel is best for them and a lot of people are focusing on it particularly now to look to put on body muscle really but is, is that something you need that people need to do all the time or do you think there needs to be a balance? Again, it'll depend on the individual. Like I don't think like any target, you know, needs to be there the whole time. And um, like something like increasing muscle mass, there's probably like an end point that you want to get to. Um, so once you get there, well, then you're looking to to maintain that. Um, so like, again, where you are at season, like, is it appropriate or is it even viable to do something like increasing your muscle mass over the course of the competitive season? Probably not when you're out running around a pitch where you can't afford to have heavy legs um, or be fatigued, um, you know, and performance is key. So I think knowing where you are, um, in the season, what your goals are um, at that point in time is, is really important to have clear in your head um, and, uh, and you can kind of work your way around um, your goals then. So for example, like 
pre-season or even off-season might be a good time to increase your muscle mass is that if that's something you feel that is going to add to your performance or if you've been told by management you need to do because um, maybe you know you're a bit slight for the team you're looking to break into and the league you're looking to play in or whatever it might be um but you're doing all the donkey work in that kind of off-season pre-season period and then you're looking to well you know, I'm in good shape now, I'm where I need to be, or as close to as I possibly can. Now I just need to make sure, you know, I'm doing what I should be doing out in the pitch. And my priority is, you know, turn up to training, switched on, ready to rock, impress um, whoever is looking and making the decisions around the team. Um, and I'm looking to maintain all the hard work that I've put in and the graft I put in, in, in that off season or pre-season period. And I'm just making sure that I'm uh, fueling appropriately so there is a, not, a case of increase in muscle mass and I suppose something like what point of the season you're at changes you know that goal because uh, your I suppose um, needs or uh, priorities change along with where you are in the season so um, it's not like not everyone needs to increase muscle mass um, you know a lot of younger athletes coming through into senior that's usually an area that they need to improve on so again it'll depend on where you're at what your body composition's like um, and you know depending on your priorities um, you know that that will and should change over over time and um, it must be the most challenging thing at the moment when you're working with GA teams and they're asking you for nutrition advice and then there's no action on at the minute. It must be hard for athletes, it must be hard to plan yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I think like the pandemic has definitely been, you know, none of us could pre- could prepare for this. We still don't really know how to deal with it. Um, like it's totally random. Like, and even like we're almost 12 months or we are 12 months, I think, down the track now since the first case in Ireland. And, um, like, it's still very unknown. Like, we're all kind of doing our best. And I think that's, like, something to remember, um, you know, that all you can do is your best. And I suppose the nice thing about being involved with teams is that there's a lot of people involved, um, you know, working towards the same goal. And, you know, there's... I suppose a lot of people, you know, that that care about one another in in you know the same kind of situation. So I think what we really need to focus on now is just looking out for one another because it is very challenging. Um, it's very difficult that you don't have the outlet of training with team members. You're doing everything on your own. It's very challenging, you know, that maybe where you're staying or where you have to be the whole time isn't maybe very in, a nice place to be like everyone's circumstances are so different and this has brought on new challenges that probably a lot of us might not be aware of or you know could never have envisaged so I think for me you know as a practitioner I'm trying to you know bear in mind first and foremost that I'm dealing with people like you know that are going through a a crazy time that none of us have ever experienced and so it's making sure that I'm supporting them and helping them get through it this as best I can um, and and being cognizant of the fact that you know it is more challenging than normal that that maybe you know your usual approach or usual targets might not actually be appropriate now uh, depending on what might be going on in someone's life you know behind behind closed doors so uh, I think uh recognizing the the crazy situation that we're in and um, recognizing uh, that people might be under more stress than normal um is kind of the the main objective and i think uh, if you are part of a team like you're fortunate in the sense that you've got you know a panel or a backroom team for the most part like in nearly every situation you know that actually care and, and it's just about trying to pull together i suppose and keep each other sane and and try and move forward and tick over as best you can but it's i suppose to to not be too hard in the sense on yourself in the sense that you know it is crazy time so if you're struggling like to to let someone know and um and and your goals you can still make progress they might look a bit different but um i suppose the key thing is is trying to um 
to, to let someone know if you are struggling with a teammate or or management, whatever your relationships um are like in within a squad. Um, and, and then you can figure out a route that works for you. It might be different to what you used to before, but this is bizarre time. So that's OK that it's different. Um, so, yeah, so it's challenging, I think, for everyone because no one knows really anything in the situation. We've never faced it. We don't really have anyone to ask how to deal with it like the world is going through this um all together um in, in one shape or another so uh, i think yeah all we can do is try to pull together and, and do our best and, and be there for each other in whatever shape that might take um so yeah um when you are with that leads or teams is sleeping pattern something um you'd look at with i suppose all your different teams or athletes yeah, definitely. Like sleep is so, so important. Like, and it's so underrated. Like it literally influences everything. And because I, I know the pandemic has changed things and hopefully it's made us re make us reframe a few things. But, you know, life was so fast paced with technology. Now we're constantly switched on. Like people literally can access us no matter where or when. Um, and that all kind of can build up um, an effect um, affect our overall our, our overall well-being and because we're so switched on our life can be so fast for many of us um very often like sleep can get the boot and if you think about like say um GAA athletes in particular like you know if they're training with the county set up but they also have a full-time job like you're, they're almost working like two full-time jobs like it's there's it's very very demanding um, and even so some uh club teams are the same like you know I suppose we ex expect a lot of ourselves as athletes um, and as teams and obviously the each year standards keep progressing so you kind of everyone feels like they need to move with it which is fair but I suppose one thing that I very regularly highlight is you know trying to get athletes to see the big picture with sleep and how it can't you can't afford to give it the boot like it has to be a priority um you know and I suppose there's many benefits in doing that like in terms of recovery you mentioned improving muscle mass like it will help with that like your cognitive function is affected um you know so and memory so again if you think of it from a, an athlete's perspective um there's a lot of maybe different plays different information that you need to retain to make sure you know you're in the right headspace going into a match you know maybe what you the person you're doing or the person you're marking is doing it, there's a lot of things that, that go on in your head and there's a lot of decisions you have to make so sleep will influence things like that so you know if, if you're not getting enough sleep um you're kind of coming up a bit short maybe then um in, in other areas um, and I suppose looking at sleep and, and quantity is important, but then quality is key too. So it's making sure that when you are sleeping, that you're getting, you know, sleep that's of high quality um, and that you've got a good a good pattern in place. So I definitely think like, you know, sleep is something that we really do have to prioritize and, and see value in, whether we play sport or not, because it literally influences so much from you know our, our performance but all you know in, in sport but also day to day like how efficient effective we are what our mood is like our energy levels are like our immune system if it's being supported or not so it's definitely definitely something that I work on with athletes but also the general population all the time like um and it's something that we really need to I suppose respect and prioritize and for your own company Nutricate um I suppose the last few years and um, social media, we've seen loads of businesses now are directly focusing on social media. It, that's something you felt you kind of had to do because a lot more people, I suppose, are on social media than going on to Google and visiting a website. Yeah, no, like social media, obviously, um, is a huge part of most of our lives now. And um, it certainly is a very useful tool from a business perspective. Like we would get a lot of our inquiries now through the likes of Instagram. Um, and like uh, it's a free tool. So I suppose what I've been trying to do over the last number of years with my own account is figure out, you know, what's actually manageable for me, what's going to be beneficial to the audience um, and 
yeah, I suppose work it out that way. But it definitely is a is a great tool. But I suppose um one thing I think that a lot of people can do is kind of get too caught up in it as well. And what I mean by that is um you can't neglect the the clients that you already have. Like they are super important. Um, so it's really important that you do a good job and you're not spreading yourself too thinly by trying to get all this content out um, the whole time. I think it's really important to kind of find that, um, I, I don't want to say balance, but, you know, find the fine line between, you know, making sure everything is looked after with, um, you know, the company running, um, the company running and the the clientele that you have um and, and getting i suppose content out there so that you your brand can keep growing and um, like one thing that we've done now um as a collective is we've got the the nutricate hub um on instagram and the idea being that obviously the team's grown now and um, so all of us can kind of show little insights to the different projects or the different clients that we're working with we can get out more content from the team that way um, because, it, you know, it's a nice way, I suppose, to connect with people, to add value to people's lives, to people's feeds. Um, and, and it can be a, a, a very useful way from a, a business perspective to get your name out there and, and to showcase everything that you can do. So I suppose it's about um, trying to be organized so that nothing, you know, you're not losing sight of what's important. And for us you know we're very client centered so who we have and who we're working with will always you know that's very important that, that they are looked after as best as we possibly can look after them and then you know if you can fit social media and growth in and around that well then it's brilliant it is a very useful tool uh, but it's about not losing sight of what really is important and it'll always be who you have in front of you and who you're working with um yeah first and foremost and then your company has grown to a huge level. But for you now, what's the aims of the future for your company? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm Right now, I'm trying to get by day by day, Paul. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep things ticking over. Um, yeah, like, I mean, there's been a lot of change of late. Like, as I said, we're, you know, a team of five now. And I just want to keep pushing the boat out on that on that front so you know I suppose the key objective now is to to make sure we keep surviving this pandemic because it's definitely changed things um, and I suppose just continue to uh, deliver you know really high quality support and content um, to make sure whoever we have the pleasure of working with you know feel valued um, and reach their their full potential and that's really the aim of the game that we can keep kind of pushing the boat out on that front and keep doing what we're doing um, and, and growing um, in the same manner because um, I certainly love my job and I I feel like uh, the rest of the team are on the same the same boat um, so we yeah just want to kind of I suppose reach as many people as we possibly can and um, and keep pushing out the boat as best we can on that front. Well, thanks a million for your time, Kim, and today it was great insight into the world of nutrition. My absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.